Judd, uh, thank you for noticing that wasn't the correct verse up there. Well, we did have a great work day yesterday. I'm so thankful for everyone who showed up. Uh, windows and screens and fans and all kinds of things were cleaned. A couple of, of um, trailer loads of debris of branches and, and uh, weeds and all kinds of things ended up going to the compost pile. So... We, we had a great turnout, and it was a beautiful day for it, so we're very thankful to get that stuff. Even put the air conditioner covers over the air conditioners. You know what that means, right? <laughs> Somebody said, are, are you going a little too soon with that? Hopefully not. So there's a story told of a group of tourists who were on a sightseeing tour. Um, hmm. Looks like uh, no sermon uh, slides there. This is what happens when Mike goes away on the youth rally. Hmm. guess that's our invitation song, though, after the lesson. <clears throat> so anyhow, there's a group of tourists who are on tour in the Holy Lands, and they came to a historical area, and there was this local exhibit owner who invited them to come in. He said, if you'll come into my exhibit, I'll show you the bones of the Apostle Peter. They're like, wow, of course, for a small fee. So they paid the fee, they went in, they looked at the bones, and one of them said, you know, on an earlier spot where we stopped, there was another exhibit that also had the bones of Peter. Your bones are much smaller than those bones. And the exhibit owner quickly said, well, these are the bones of Peter when he was a boy. <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? Although there are many legends and myths surrounding the Apostle Peter, it's been my goal through this series to study the life of Peter in a biblical and truthful way, and I hope we've done that. I hope our sermon series on Peter's life has blessed you as much as it has blessed me, and it's with sadness that we come to the end of the study today. We started the series 18 sermons ago, back in May. Some of you are thinking, oh, I thought it's been years. No, it hasn't been that long. In Peter's very first encounter with Jesus, Jesus gave him the name Rock. Of course, he wasn't much of a rock at the start, was he? But we've seen him grow into that name. In Peter's next encounter with Jesus, he was given a call to become a fisher of men. And Peter and Andrew and James and John, the business partners, they left their nets and their boats immediately, and they followed Jesus. And when we follow Jesus, there's much we have to leave behind as well. As we've journeyed with Peter and followed Jesus, we've witnessed his highs and his lows. We, we've seen Peter get it, and we've seen when Peter didn't get it, right? We've seen him do the right thing, we've seen him do the wrong thing. One minute Peter's walking on the water with Jesus, and the next minute he's sinking, right? One minute, Peter is declaring Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the next minute, he tries to keep Jesus from completing God's mission. Jesus has to call him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. We've journeyed with Peter as, we, as he witnessed Jesus' glory in the transfiguration. Wow. We've seen him witness the power of Jesus to heal and to cast out demons, and to do all kinds of miraculous things like catches of fish, right? With, with all kinds of nets full of fish. And, and even that one miraculous catch where it was a single fish with the coin in his mouth. When many in the crowds turned their back on Jesus because of the demands of discipleship were great, Jesus said to his disciples, um, Do you too want to leave and Peter was the one who said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. You are the Holy One of God. We watched Peter learn how to serve when Jesus washed his feet. Remember that? We learned that there is hope for the falling when we saw the way Jesus dealt with Peter after the denial. We saw how after the resurrection, the angel sent the message saying that Jesus wanted to see Peter. Later that day, Jesus made his own personal appearance, private appearance to Peter. And then there was that reinstatement on the shores of the lake, and 
John 21. So we saw the change that came over Peter after the resurrection. The change that came over Peter after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Peter rose to that occasion that day, and he proclaimed the truth about Jesus to the crowd of Jews there in Pentecost. And the church grew from about 120 people to over 3,000 that day. And from that day forward, we saw the influence of Peter's life as he had a ministry of healing and helping and encouraging. He had a ministry of rebuking and correcting. And, and we saw his courage, how in the face of threats of the Jewish leaders, arrests and imprisonments and beatings, Peter kept on proclaiming the truth about Jesus. At the house of the Gentile named Cornelius, we witnessed Peter allowing God to change his heart and his mind, to give up the prejudices that he had had against the Gentiles. And then just last week, we saw Peter's miraculous escape from prison, from the hand of Herod. And as we saw that, we, along with Peter in the early church, had to work to understand that God is in control and that God's will is not always our will. But today, as we bring our journey with Peter to completion, I want us to look at what we know about the end of Peter's life. This comes to us not from Scripture, but from tradition and history. I also want us to encourage us to think about Peter's legacy as we think about our own legacy. See, see God has put into every human heart this, this sense of eternity, and, and we've been built by God in a way that causes us to always pursue meaning. The heart's desire of every human being is to mean something and to be valuable in some way. And that heart's desire has caused many people to despair and others to chase after all kinds of empty pursuits. But the only way to have true meaning is for our lives to be rightly related to God. The only way to have a permanent value is to be rightly related to God. And Peter understood that truth. And he lived a life that was rightly related to God. He became a great man and a great leader in the church. And so after that council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, which was one of the last mentions of Peter in the book of Acts, it was about A.D. 49. Peter concentrated his efforts on the vast multitudes of Israelites that were scattered throughout the eastern portions of the empire. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul wrote about the approval that he had received for his ministry from Peter and James and John, the reputed pillars of the church there in Jerusalem. And they said Paul should go to the Gentiles and that they, Peter and the rest should go to the Jews. And so, unless tradition is very much mistaken, the last 16 or 17 years of Peter's life were occupied by a wide system of evangelistic ministry, accompanied by his devoted wife. Peter went from place to place, leading many people to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. And it appears that Peter ended up in Rome, and perhaps wrote 1st and 2nd Peter from Rome. When Peter ended that first letter of his, he wrote saying, She who is in Babylon sends you her greetings. 1st Peter 5.13. There's been much speculation as to whether that Babylon that sends the greetings is the true Babylon of the Middle East, or if that is in some way the figurative name of Rome. You recall in the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus in John 21 when, when Jesus reinstated Peter there beside the lake around the fire when he asked him three times if he loved him. They also had a conversation about the end of Peter's life and how at the end of his life he would be led where he doesn't want to go. John tells us this was to talk about the kind of death that Peter would face. The fulfillment of that prophecy took place there in Rome during Nero's persecution when Peter was executed along with his wife in A.D. 66. This isn't recorded in the New Testament, 
But there are numerous references in the church fathers. I want to read a few of those references to you. Clement of Alexandria in 195 A.D. wrote, Peter, on seeing his wife led to death, rejoiced on account of her call to go home and shouting to her very encouragingly and comfortingly by name and saying, Remember the Lord. Such was the marriage of the blessed apostle. Unquote. Lactanitus wrote in 320 A.D., while Nero reigned, the Apostle Peter came to Rome, and through the power of God committed to him, he worked certain miracles. And by turning many to the truth, he built up a faithful and steadfast church to the Lord. It was Nero who had Peter crucified. Lactanitus also wrote, Excrevel and notorious tyrant as he was, Nero determined to destroy the heavenly church, to abolish righteousness, and becoming the persecutor of God's servants, he crucified Peter and slew Paul. Dionysius, the bishop of Corinth in the second century, states that Peter and Paul suffered martyrdom at the same time. And Jerome in the fourth century attests that Peter was crucified and crowned with martyrdom, his head being turned earthward and his feet in the air because he held he was unworthy to be crucified as the Lord was. Peter the Rock is faithful to the end. As we move toward the conclusion, I want to share with you three reasons why Peter's life has eternal repercussions. I'm borrowing these from a sermon by Erwin Lutzer. I thought he summarized it well. Now, as we consider these repercussions, though, keep in mind that Peter had been just a common fisherman, right? Before his call to become a follower and an apostle of Jesus before he experienced the touch of the master's hand. Peter was a common human just like me and you. He was a sinner and struggled with the same struggles that you and I face, yet because of God's work in his life, his legacy continues to inspire us today. And our legacy can inspire others also. So first of all, Peter's life has eternal repercussions because of what he believed, because of what he believed. And let's notice some of what Peter believed by his writings. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter believed because of what he had seen and what he had heard. Peter understood more clearly than anyone that he'd been in the company of God in the flesh. He believed in God incarnate. And I know all of us wish we could have been there, right? We could have lived in that time. We could have seen what he saw and heard what he heard. But we have something just as good. And so Peter continues in verse 19 and following saying, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture came from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy is ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along. By the Holy Spirit. Peter believed in the incarnate word, Jesus, but he also believed in the written word. And the word of God is a lamp shining in the dark places of the world. And that word can shine in our hearts. 
We need to believe in that light of God. Now, there's a day coming when that light's not going to be needed any longer. But until that time, we have the sure word of testimony. We can trust in God's word. We must know and trust in what we believe. Peter's life had an everlasting impact because of what he believed, and so can ours. But secondly, Peter's life has eternal repercussions, not just because of what he believed, but because of what he did based on his belief. We don't have time to talk about all that Peter did. We don't even know all that Peter did. But we know he preached sermons, and he testified to the truth, and he helped many people in many ways. Many things Peter did because of his faith had a great impact on the lives of multitudes of people. I like what Revelation 14 and verse 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Shakespeare said, that the evil that men do lives after them, but the good is interred with their bones. It's an interesting thing to think about. Some truth in that. God does keep track of the good and the bad deeds. Thankfully, those of us who are in Christ, those bad deeds are forgiven and forgotten. But throughout our series on Peter, I've been saying that our lives can have an impact for good or for evil. Every deed you and I do has repercussions, sometimes for generations to come. We have an impact on adults and children around us, in our homes, our neighborhoods, the church, everywhere we go. And we won't know the full impact of our lives until the end of time, until it's all over. And then we'll see it clearly. Peter's life has eternal repercussions because of what he believed and because of what he did. But there's one more thing. Because of what he became. God's in the business of changing people. Aren't you glad about that? Peter wasn't a rock at the beginning. But he became a rock. God wants to change each of our hearts and our lives. God wants us to be more like Him because we're made in His image. And He wants to change us from the inside out. Peter, in his second letter, wrote about this transformation that God wants to bring into our lives. He wrote this starting in verse 3 of chapter 1. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious And very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. How awesome is it that God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness? God's not held back anything. It's available. How awesome is it that God has given us His precious and great promises? God keeps His promises. And how awesome is it that we get to participate in the divine nature? We're human, and yet God gives us the divine nature when we become His. And what a relief it is that we can escape the corruption of the world. We can overcome the sinful desires that are in us and around us. But so much of what we become is because what God has done for us on our behalf. But there is a lot that we need to do in cooperation with God. And Peter goes on to talk about that in the next verses. For this very reason, the reason of all the wonderful things God's done for us, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if 
These qualities are yours and are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You hear Peter's urgency? We need to make every effort to add these qualities to our lives, being more diligent to confirm our calling by our faithfulness and our godliness. But look at that wonderful promise wrapped up in all this. If we make the effort... We will be effective. We will be productive. And we will never fall. That's a great promise. To drive home this need to change, Peter ended his letter pointing to the end time, asking a very important question. 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Isn't that the most important question there is? What sort of people ought you be? Because this is what's going to happen in the end. Every earthly thing that we know is going to be burned up, dissolved, or destroyed. Think about it. That includes every beautiful, amazing work of art, every car, every house, every toy, all clothes and jewelry, everything. Everything except for human beings or human souls, maybe we should say. The human soul is the only earthly thing that will live forever. Every human soul will live on in eternal reward or in eternal punishment. So how then shall we live? Peter would say, make every effort to change and to grow so your life will have a positive, eternal impact. As we studied the life of Peter, we were reminded again and again just how much God loves us and just how patient and forgiving God is with us. But also, isn't it amazing that God has chosen to work through imperfect folks like Peter and like us the life of Peter certainly illustrates the old saying, God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. God did and continues to do so much through the life of a man named Peter. And after seeing the way that God could work with the likes of Peter, aren't you encouraged to think about how God can work through the likes of me and you? Let's end the sermon series the way we began, with the old poem by Myra Brooks Welch, written in 1921 called The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who'll start the bidding for me, a dollar, a dollar, or two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no.'" From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What am I bidding for this old violin? And he held it up with a bow. 
a thousand dollars. Who will make it two? Two thousand. And who will make it three? Three thousand once. Three thousand twice. And going and gone, said he. And the people cheered. But some of them cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. And swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone, but the master comes. And the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul. And the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hands. And all of us are just like that old battered violin. We're not worth very much in and of ourselves. But in the master's hands, we can be used to make beautiful music. God can redeem us and transform us And we can spend an eternity with God and our lives can have a positive eternal impact just like the man named Peter. But the time is passing. And we don't know how much more time we have to leave a legacy. We can't go back and change the beginning. We can't go back and change the middle, but we can change what the end looks like. We can start over today and make a new ending because of the touch of the master's hand.